that we pick on when we change the commandments. Uh, scripture lets us start from Exodus chapter 20. Uh, there are several editions of the Ten Commandments in Scripture. This is really, I guess, the first uh, in total. And so we're going to work from Exodus chapter 20. Uh, before we get there, we have a few things to talk about. For one, I saw some of y'all joke, and I got harassed a lot this week about the fact that we're doing the Ten Commandments in nine weeks. So there was some talk about which one you're going to drop, which one's not important. Uh, we're actually combining the first two today. And so after today, we'll leave me alone and be on track. Um, the first two candidates they coincide really well, so it makes good sense. Uh, also, ultimately, in nine weeks, uh, Easter is part of them. So we want to be done with our series. It's a church-wide series, and be prepared for Easter. Uh, but today, as we dig into them, and this kind of thing of boundless, uh, I want to tell you that uh, we found one of Herod's diaries this past year. Yeah? You ready for this? Um, and so she's not here today. She actually, she's a nurse, and so she works some weekends. She's not with us today. But I, I really wish she was so that you could look at her and see her nod. And I've been approved for whatever I'm going to share from her diary and our personal. I promise she's so on board. Just you need to ask her when you see her. Uh, I've really been approved here. Promise you. Uh, we found one of her diaries, and she's not one of those the super attentive, write a journal entry every single day with details of every moment of every bit of life. People. Um, she's one of those people that has kept a diary and pretty faithfully will come, come back to it every few months or even once a year just to kind of check in and, and leave herself some notes, which is something that I envy. It's really a strong thing to do, to take a look back at where you've been and, and what's going on. Um, and so we took a look, and one of the, the past few entries, the last few entries that we had were from uh, 05, 07, around the time that we had uh, met. We're together and meeting together and growing together. Um, and it's just hilarious to read the last few entries because it reflects the central reality of our relationship for a long time was one of uh, different understandings of the relationship. Okay? And then, have you ever been in a relationship where you have different understandings of the relationship? Anybody? They're giggling. You know what I'm talking about, maybe. Uh, we're growing different pages sometimes. Okay, so for instance, when we met at Asbury Hill, the summer camp at this camp, um, one of us you know up front that we know that summer camp is sometimes a place where romance blooms, either for campers or for counselors, and you meet lots of couples who met and got married because they met at summer camp. Uh, for me in particular, I felt like if I met a girl who could deal with the, the nastiness and sleeplessness and dirtiness and outdoorsiness of camp, this was a pretty strong pool of potential spouses to take a look at. But also, it was my second summer, and that had not gone well for me the first summer. So I entered the summer with almost a vow to not be on the lookout for anything like that. Okay, not look for potential relationships. Focus on the children, their job, yes, okay. Um, Taryn was arriving with a similar vow. Um, she'd come out actually out in a pretty hostile relationship where she'd been. And so, summer was to be a time for her, and really, the next few months, for her to really find herself be single and heal, which is, are some things that I didn't learn until time had passed. But if we met, I'll tell you that probably in the two weeks of staff training, I knew at the end of that two weeks what, what did I mean? She was the one, this is perfect, I was going to marry her first, right? We were going to get married, it was going to be great, okay? She didn't, I, I feel like she felt that also. <laughs> She would say yes or no, okay? Because again, coming out of this place, no dating, no guys, guys don't exist. And so we lived in this funky place. And my mom, too, she said, different people who do us, we lived in this funky place for many months. Of what were we? And we clearly, I think we both knew, by the way, that we were soulmates and it was awesome and gonna be awesome. At the same time, there was this Terry Ben produces great after maybe six or seven months, and I thought surely you were boyfriend and girlfriend at least, maybe, semi. She was still introducing in the funniest way, depending on who it was. And sometimes it was almost like boyfriend, sometimes it was here. This is my, my friend. My friend, Josh. This is Josh. Okay. This messed up. Now it's for like the first year of our time together. Now in hindsight, and looking at her journal, she still reckons our first date the way that I do, which is at the end of camp training, after two weeks, we went to a Mexican restaurant and I paid for her cheap dip. So purchase is made, and that's the reckoning of the first date, okay? 
Uh, she agrees now, but for a long time. And it was as funny as comedy now, but it was tragedy for me for a long time. It was hard, man, to be in those different pages. Okay, and some of y'all say, ha ha, I won, I outlasted, I finally pulled her or whatever, I got her. Her life, ring on the finger, right? Game over, prisoner. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but it was great to look back at the diary entries to remember those days. Uh, and it reminds me of a thing that we used to use back in those days, which is something called a DTR and the need for a DTR. Does anybody know about the DTR? Somebody want to tell us what the DTR stands for? You remember? Defining the relationship. Okay, so the DTR, so, so before social media had relationship status, right, where you go on some dates and you're kind of friends, but sooner or later they put in a relationship with someone said on Facebook. So you know where you stand at that point. Before those days, we had to kind of just figure out what was going on. Okay, and so the, the way to do that was to have the DTR, the defining the relationship talk. And that could be a tough talk to have also. Because you know what it's like when two folks are kind of coming together and they're kind of friends and kind of not, and one feels stronger than the other, and one wants to get married forever and ever, and one's not sure. And it's just when two people try to find that same plane with the same assumption to operate from, it's a tricky thing. It's an incredibly important thing because we know that without defining, defining the relationship, uh, we can go down some really nasty paths. We can really exploit one another. Uh, we can really uh, use and abuse one another. You know, if I know that somebody's madly in love with me, but they're kind of just friendly me, from my perspective, it's easy for me to get from them what I need, which is attention and affection and obsession, and then not to return it. That's a, that's a bad place to be. Some of us have been there. I've definitely been there. To find the relationship, the DTR is incredibly important. It's about our common ground for how we're going to relate, what we're going to expect from us, one another, and so forth. And faithfulness and so much more. And so Karen and I needed that. We had them over and over and what it worked for here. And so good job. Uh, and not just that old school set of rules you know, displayed on the wall with two tablets, whatever that might look like for you. We take a look at this idea of a framework of relationship. And it's a big deal. Really, the deeper the relationship and the more that's at stake, maybe the more important it is to have that same understanding of the plane of, of operating in a relationship. Does that make sense? So when it comes to marriage, we have a special word for, for that. We call it covenant. Covenant. A deep, interrelated, intimate connection where we understand where we stand. And when we approach it like in marriage, which is probably our ultimate symbol or Example of covenant. Again, the more deep the covenant, the more outlined the relationship tends to be, the more defined, the more deep the DTR might be. And so, for instance, when we get married and we say our vows to one another, is it something like, you know, I'm just going to love you? You know, and I'm just going to love you. And amen, kiss the bride, and go on your way. Is that it? No. So I brought the vows. Standard nine methods vows. Some of y'all are familiar with it. I hate to read them because I know that sometimes you just drone through them. Hopefully not you in your service, but it happens. Uh, we repeat these kinds of vows over and over. And it is so much more than I'm just I'm gonna kind of, I'm just gonna love you, baby. Forever. I'm gonna love you too. Listen to this. In the name of God, I, Josh, take you here to be my wife. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better or worse, for richer or poorer. Think about how these specific details got inserted in here and why. Why would we name for richer or poorer? In sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death, this is my solemn vow. That is a defined relationship because there is a lot at stake if you don't approach it each of us with the same understanding. That is again where we are in Exodus chapter 20. The first two commandments that we're going to tackle today, and I want you to just see if you get some sense that God is defining the relationship. It says, Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But show me steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Just thanks to God for it. Are you familiar? No other God before me and no greater than me. And again, I don't think we need to hear those just as the thou, thou shalt not rule book of the Old Testament. We need to start to try to hear those as the finding of a relationship, as a covenant relationship, as an interconnected, intimate bond with God and how that's going to look. And our expectations of God and God's expectations of us. That's, that's how we approach it. Now I think really there's some ways to adapt this to our own language without hopefully adjusting it to me. And I just challenge you to hear God as He speaks these things to us. Things that I hear from God, from God's heart, first and foremost, is we are going to be exclusive. You hear that? God looks at each of us and through this covenant declares to us we are going to be exclusive. Yep. Is that a big deal? It's a key. As in, on, on, on our end, we're going to be exclusive. We have to do everything we can to challenge that human nature piece of us that is always looking for the next best thing, and for the next greener passion, and for the next person that might really be the one, even more than the one that's in front of us. Which is a challenge that we face lots of times through premarital counseling and it's a challenge that we face with folks who have a hard time thinking about settling down and getting married. Okay. So our declaration from God, we are going to be exclusive together. And there are demands on our end. There are demands on God too. Ultimately, God is, is accepting the fact that God is going to be enough for all our needs. God is declaring to us that we're not going to have to look another thing or another one and that frankly no other one will do like God. And that's a big deal. Just let that walk over you. God declares that you are going to be exclusive. Okay? Second thing that we do here um, from God is that you're not going to be able to settle for fantasy and false substitutes anymore. You're not going to be able to settle or fantasy and false substitutes anymore. You hear that? No greater images. Because God knows that we have a back as human beings. We're liking things that we can touch and hold and control and shape. Or things that we can make say and do whatever we want when it comes to our gods, our idols. But we like things that make us feel a certain way at a certain time. False substitutes and fantasy. And most of us know how false substitutes and fantasies can fill an exclusive relationship in real life. Okay? And God declared this to us. I'm not, I'm asking you to never settle again. It's a big deal. It's funny because if you continue in Exodus chapter 20, God goes on to describe this in a practical way. God says, if you're going to make an altar for me to worship and to do sacrifices and stuff, I want you to just make it out of dirt. Straight up. Just dirt. Like, this is God. You're the God of the universe. Can we make it fancy or like just make it out of dirt? It says if you have to make it out of stone, rock, don't even cut it with a tool. Just use regular natural stones and pile them up. Like, that's kind of weird. You just maybe think that's your God to be shared. But God's point was we have a knack for transforming the stuff of God into our stuff. As in, as soon as you start carving up the stones and making me a pretty altar, and writing nice things and drawing nice pictures and making it gold and, and beautiful for the Lord, very quickly it is not the Lord's anymore. It is mine and ours. And we made it look and act and be whatever we want. That's our nature. And God knows it. He says, it's just very simple. God looks at us and says, We're going to be exclusive if you want to be a part of the relationship. And I'm never going to let you settle for false substitutes and fantasies. <coughs> It's just not, it's 
not good, it's not life. And then the last thing that we hear today, which is where for some of us it gets a little rough, is that God talked about punishing children and all this stuff. What we need to hear God say to me is that God is going to pursue us passionately and relentlessly. I'm a jealous God. And that our connection to God, whether we like it or not, is going to have implications for our children and our children's children. It's that important. It's that pervasive. It's that inescapable. It's the way we were made. And so if God is the ultimate relationship for whom we were made, then to flee that or to choose other options and try anything else is ultimately going to harm us and our children and our children's children. This is not what we were made for. And we need to hear God say that. And it's Frankly, that kind of a benefit. Have you ever enjoyed somebody being jealous of you? Come on now, pray for that. Have you ever enjoyed making somebody jealous? It's like, what's up? They really like you, right? Right? That's probably how it works with Terry, to be honest. I think somewhere in that friend zone, I was like, well, I'm like, we're just friends, I'm going to go talk to her. And she's like, whoa, right? So, I'm just kidding. Kind of, not, kind of. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> jealousy can be a terrible thing. And manipulation and all that stuff. And jealous relationships can be a terrible thing. But we know in a way, sometimes how convicting it can be to realize our real desire for somebody. And this feelings kind of rise up enough. We want somebody enough. We want to have them and be with them enough. And it bothers us to think they might be elsewhere. God very straight up and honestly looks at us and says, I'm going to just passionately pursue you. It's how I've made this relationship to be. And it's, it's inescapable that it's going to implicate you, your children, your children's children. And that is it before it folks. We don't have any more funny stories or illustrations. That's just the plain truth. Here. And I don't know if you've ever gotten that from the Ten Commandments. We tackle commandments one and two. But we hear God's voice in love speaking to us about relationship, covenant relationship. It's amazing that God would form this interconnected relationship with us where everything that one party does affects the other party. How do we know that that's the nature of things? Because ultimately, one day, Christ is the fulfillment of this relationship. And it was God's way to say to us, how much does this matter to you? Enough that I will die so that you can fulfill it. I will die. We don't need to be together. That's a huge thing to wrap our, our hearts around. We don't need to do that. Consider what it is. We have a boundless God, infinite, who has boundless love and grace, totally unconditional. He also invites us into this kind of boundless life. So while it's unconditional, there are expectations. We know that God is specific in some way and defined as good and holy and just and merciful. So no, God just, just doesn't settle for us to be any old way. Because God loves us, God invites us up into this relationship. Where are we going to be for the next few weeks? So what's more good? Go ahead and do what you can to dig into these other commandments. And really, a great way to think about them is the ten words of relationship, the ten words of the covenant. So let us pray. Holy One, we know that Scripture and, and our history is really your story of how you reach down to us and, and reach out to us and try to reveal your infiniteness to us in a way we can understand. And how you try to call us up into being like you, being the people that you made us to be. Lord, for all that, we give you thanks, Lord, for are these words of covenant that we know sometimes we treat as, as rules, sometimes we treat them as qualifications in order to earn your love. Well, that is false. Help us to know. Well, these are words to a people that you had already set free, that you were just trying to guide up into true freedom. So we pray for this in the boundless life, full life, the truly boundless life, and not just foolish. So please, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.